I will take us back to where, first of all, where we ended, which I believe was right here. We were talking about acetylcholine, every move you make, every breath you take, remember that? I even have the songs now, but I'm not gonna play them for you, because would you guys like to hear them? Okay, so remember, acetylcholine, it's just simply one of the, which one do you wanna hear first? You don't really care, do you? So now you know what I'm talking about? That's loud. She's singing about acetylcholine and didn't <laughs> even know it. Wow, what's up with that? Here, police, they were doing the same thing. So, what, this is Christian, this is non-Christian music, this is praise music, this is the devil's music. <laughs> I don't believe that, that was just a joke. So every breath you take, look. Yeah. Okay, whatever. <laughs> it is acetylcholine, that's what happens, that's why when you make movement, that's, and that's why you get bit by one of these black widow spiders, it's going to flood and fool your system into dumping it full of acetylcholine, and then it exhausts it. So guess what, one time um, it was on an Easter day and I was going over to, we were going as a family over to another faculty member's house, I remember. So we get up, this is just, I don't know, a couple years ago. And uh, my son goes like this, he goes, oh man, something bit me. And, uh, and it was like a couple minutes later, we we're getting in the car and I go, what happened? He goes, I don't know, man, it was like a, it was, a, I know it was a spider or a bug, something bad. And uh, so we're driving, and he goes, it, it, and I said, how is it? He goes, that just burns. It burns like crazy. And uh, so didn't think anything of it, but at, while we were at this place, he, at some point in the day, he got like an ice pack and put it on there just to keep, because it's so hot, he said. He kept talking about it. It's like four or five, six hours later. We're at home, and he comes over, and he goes, hey, Dad, check this out. Remember I told you I got bit? He goes, I remember now swatting something away and I went into the bathroom and I remember putting on my t-shirt in there and I remember swatting something away and he goes, I found it. And I, we went and looked at it, it was a brown widow spider. I don't know if you know what brown widows are, they're like black widows, they're a little bit more toxic. And so, um, <laughs> so I thought, this is a cool psych thing, Drew, let's check it out and see what happens. And uh, let, let's see your arm. So it was all like messed up, not bad, not in a bad way, it was just like hot and red. And, uh, now, there's something you need to know about toxins like this. Acetylcholine goes in and it deplete, eventually it depletes it. Um, it. For example, if you were to take nicotine right now in, in any form, uh, nicotine usually comes in, we think about it as in, in, in a chewing form with tobacco or a smoking form or whatever. It is actually going to go in there and cause more of acetylcholine to be involved and you're going to make more and it's going to open up more gates because your brain's going to get fooled by this going, ooh, make more gates right here. Remember the gates? This, could you put your leg up for me? <laughs> Would you mind? That's the gate right here. And then, uh, and all of these aisleways are the gates into this next nerve cell that the channels that open up. And then, well anyway, that's what nicotine does and that's what this acetylcholine was doing. And so anyway, it turns out we waited. I told Drew, hey, let, let, let's don't go to the hospital tonight. You'll be fine. I don't you, you uh, need to go to the doctor at all. <laughs> And in the morning, he was, he, he was just fine. His arm was uh, attached, the, the, uh, the bite was kind of gone, and, he, and that's kind of what happened. So it's not deadly if he was younger or if it bit him near the heart or bit him a couple of times, and then, then we would have reacted differently, but he was fine by the morning. And, but that's what happens. The brain responds in a certain way. And I told you sarin gas, sarin gas that was used as an, uh, a nerve, um, what we call nerve gas um, immediately begins um, to keep the acetylcholine from breaking down. And I believe this is where we ended last time. So is that right? Is that kind of how we stopped and where you were? And um, so what I want to do is give us an opportunity to, um, to, to understand neurotransmitters and to make sure you understand what's going on. So I'm going to do a quick review, all right? A quick review of what's going on at this level right here between two nerve cells and be thinking about something like a nerve gas or be thinking about something like a neurotransmitter and I'll put this back up in a second if you still need it 
But what I'd like to do is show you um, a, uh, the process by which a nerve cell works because we went back to here. And if you remember this, this is the slide. Oh, and I put this on Blackboard for you. How many found it on Blackboard already? Oh, this whole slide's on Blackboard. Wouldn't that be cool? So now you can go in, and if you get, miss something, it's there, and you could go look at the artwork and just marvel. <laughs> so you remember the ions, the backpacks? Remember that? And, and, and where are the vesicles that contain the neurotransmitters? Raise your hand if I said you were a vesicle which contained a neurotransmitter. Raise your hand. If you're on this side of the room, everybody would be a vesicle, right? And, do you remember that? And so all y'all, and, and we called you, we said you were garages, right? They were garages, and so now, inside of these garages were the transmitters that like these keys, so inside each of them were these keys that would float across. They would come down here, ready? This right here, this is the fluid, this is the gap. So this whole area right in here, this black, and, and wherever these are, this is this aisle way, the synaptic gap between two nerve cells. And remember, we said, here comes the electrical impulse. It travels down, opens the vesicles, the garage opens, the neurotransmitters flood into here. They go attach themselves right here to this lock. They attach themselves. And when this lock gets attached to right over here, I don't have a key, but it goes across. Could you hold your hand? <laughs> and so the key comes across, and then this gate opens right there, and as soon as it opens, okay, you can put it back, it closes back up and, and then the neurotransmitter gets sucked back up. And by the way, here's a visual of what it looks like, just, just so you can kind of see it in, I guess, I guess in real time. So it, it, as we dive deep into this brain, you'll see some really uh, very, I guess the same thing I was just showing you, but I made a, a more involved PowerPoint. So there it is. Those are the backpacks. Do you see that? The gate opens and they flood in. And that, those electrically charged backpacks, ions, flood into that system. And here come the neurotransmitters to begin it. See that? Here come the vesicles right there. And they open up. So these vesicles open up and these keys open these gates right there. That's the gate. That's the person's leg, if you want. So here it comes again, here are the vesicles, here come the keys, they land right there, that neurotransmitter right there, it lands and watch. It opens up and here come the backpacks flowing through. Pretty cool, huh? I didn't make this. <laughs> that would have been cool if I would have done that, but somebody else made that and they did a great job with it and I just copied it, okay? So. What I want you to know, and to, does, does that all make sense? Is there anything that doesn't make sense? Can you, can you the, the illustration helps me, because I can think visually in here and see things. And then remember, these neurotransmitters get sucked back up, and that's how we talked about cocaine, sucking back what, what normally would be these keys, instead it blocks the vacuum cleaner. Remember that? And so we talked about Novocaine blocking the garage doors from opening. Okay, well, if you guys have that, there's the vacuum cleaners. And all of this, like I said, is, is on PowerPoint on the slide, but you can look at it there um, for questions. No questions, I'm gonna move forward. We're gonna get to um, a few more uh, chemical uh, effects, and then we're gonna talk about some, uh, some brain things that are going on as well. All right. All right, so then let's move forward. To summarize what I said about uh, uh, addictions, and in particular, uh, when um, a, an addictive drug, while addictive drugs mimic or block neurotransmitters or the functioning of neurotransmitters or the processing or modulating of. But just to simplify it uh, and to make it kind of quick, all addictive drugs mimic or block the functioning or the processing of the nervous system at the neurotransmitter level, okay? Dopamine is one of these probably involved neurotransmitters that your brain makes uh, that are implicated in lots of things and when you take in drugs from the outside, the dopamine system is involved. Now I wanna tell you what you're messing with 
almost every known addictive drug from tobacco to caffeine to cocaine to marijuana do something at a variety of levels, in particular the dopamine level and the dopamine system. So just to know what people are messing with when they take in something like that, that's a chemical that, we, that can be addictive, remember what I told you, where's dopamine involved? If I take a, the spinal fluid from an individual with schizophrenia, what do I find? I find an excessive amount of dopamine. Schizophrenia and schizophrenics almost always show an excessive amount of dopamine. And so when a drug mimics or it acts like dopamine, let's say methamphetamines, what's one of the most common side effects of taking a methamphetamine? Schizophrenic-like symptoms. People get paranoid. Guy across the street from me was a methamphetamine user and he was paranoid and I didn't really know what was going on. All I know that police showed up a lot. He, you know, he was messed up a lot. But one day, I'm, did I tell you the story? One day I'm sitting there fixing my sprinklers and I have to bend down like this and look and as I'm looking at the sprinkler trying to dig at something and I'm looking at it and his house is right across the street over there and, I, and I'm working on it and all of a sudden I see him just staring at me, looking at me. And I kind of go, oh, hey, and I go, I wave like that and he just kind of let, stares at me and, and kind of goes like that and walks away. Well, it turns out he was struggling with, with paranoia. He was a meth user and that's one of the side effects it starts to show things that are going on in the brain that mimic some of our disorders. By the way, the other thing that happens with dopamine is if I give a schizophrenic, which I told you I worked with many of them, I worked at a state hospital for the criminally insane on this maximum security ward. And I did that for about, a, I don't know, three, four months. And uh, when we would go in there, I told you we would give them a schizophrenics, paranoid schizophrenics in particular, but we'd give them a drug that would block the effect of dopamine and their symptoms came down but if we gave them too much they began to show signs of they started to show what symptoms they started to show shakes like Parkinson's because Parkinson's is associated with decreased amounts of dopamine in the brain so uh, that's a review are you getting it remember all this so you can see how just simply minor changes to that which goes on at this chemical key level is going to have an influence on this. And I'm not going to list up here, but dopamine is involved in, with heroin and uh, it, it triggers the release of uh, dopamine. You don't have to write this down. Amphetamines stimulate the release of dopamine. Cocaine, as I told you, blocks dopamine. Uh, and by the way, these are the number of users in the past month. Uh, this is a couple of years old, the data, but 200,000 users in the past month in this country, at methamphet or amphetamines, 800,000 users, cocaine, a million users. 10 million at marijuana, alcohol, uh, 11 million abusers, uh, nicotine, 61 million, and the, again, these numbers are, are a little bit dated, but that's, and then caffeine, the entire world, basically. Uh, they, they, there's like, we found five guys who had never had caffeine, and uh, they were all in the state of Utah. <laughs> no, not really, but, <laughs> no, not really, I, that, I, that's not nice. But um, there are actually some people, uh, and I, I apologize, it's just caffeine in general, a lot of people use it, some people don't. Okay? Endorphins, uh, uh, brain uh, morphine, or internal morphine. Does that sound like the word endorphins? Have you heard, what's the, what's, what word comes to mind when you think of morphine? <coughs> well, what's the effect of morphine? Who do we give morphine to? soldiers or athletes or people in pain, we give them morphine and your brain has morphine just like, see your brain gets fooled, remember, by, by morphine and it goes like this. There's a pain message that gets sent and if I were to poke you or punch you or hit you or get, you get hurt some way or shot or whatever and now you're, this, this pain, substance P pain goes like this, ow, ow, like that sort of, it just sends a message but your brain interprets it and it goes up into the brain and the brain goes like this, ow. Morphine stops substance P from being sent across, and so you don't feel pain so much, but guess what you have? You have internal morphine in your brain. That's why external morphine works, because the brain's fooled in thinking it's its own internal morphine. We call it endorphin or internal morphine. It's like its own little syringe, and your brain's going off, going whenever, whenever you get in pain, 
But some of you may have felt this even if you weren't in a lot of pain or something. How many of you are athletes or, well, how many of you ever like get runners high? You're exercising a lot, running a lot, and all of a sudden you just get, you just get a bunch of like adrenaline going and no longer do you feel tired. Has anybody ever felt runners high like that before? That is your body's, in, unless you took morphine and didn't tell anybody <laughs> like that, like, oh, I feel good. I don't know what happened. Um, but if not, if for most of you, guess what? It's internal morphine. It just goes off in your brain and your brain goes like this, oh, I feel good. And by the way, people like that flood and that release. Uh, that's why drugs, by the way, get abused. It, we, people don't abuse drugs because they make them homeless and they make them lose their marriages and they make them, you know, steal things and go to jail. That's not why people use drugs. People use drugs because it's pleasurable. It feels good. Did that runner's high? How many other runner's high? Did it feel good? Was it like, oh, I just got, you recapture. It's like the pain goes away and it's replaced by pleasure. That's what, that's what addictions do. It replaces pain with pleasure. The problem is the brain makes adjustments. So cocaine comes in, it blocks the reuptake of dopamine, your pleasure increases, and then all of these, if these were, let's say, receptor sites right here that were holding on and the key comes across, could you hold, and so a key comes across and it attaches right here and goes click, click, and the gates open, when you take cocaine, and there's too much of it, the brain goes like this, get rid of that one, get rid of that one, stop turning this off, get rid of them, get rid of them, get rid of them, get rid of them, you got too much dopamine. And now people can't even experience normal everyday pleasure. That's what happens, that's an addiction. And so now you're like, give me more, because I don't even feel pleasure at what normally would make me feel pleased. All right. Serotonin, by the way, <laughs> and you fall asleep, that kind of drowsy, good feeling, things we associate with sleep. Now, by the way, each of these neurotransmitters does more than just what I'm alluding to today. I'm kind of simplifying, but serotonin is involved in that kind of feeling of sleepiness and uh, that good feeling of just being calmed and eventually falling asleep. John, go ahead. Do uh, drugs counsel permanently alter brain chemistry? Does what does? Um, most of the time, the answer is this, taking drugs, um, that, 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 especially a lot of the addictive drugs that we know about, does, does change the brain chemistry, no doubt, has an influence. The cool thing about all of this is that the brain and our bodies in general are an amazing, they're, they're what we call the, the plasticity of the brain. And I'm gonna illustrate this in just a little bit. It repairs itself oftentimes. Sometimes, with some meth users, it's so strong that the damage becomes permanent. And sometimes things like marijuana get lodged in the brain. This particular component of marijuana gets lodged and sometimes comes out at weird times and permanently influences or impacts, in a negative way, our memory systems. But most of the time, when we get off of those and there's a, a process of not only with, you know, getting out of uh, and getting finished with the withdrawal symptoms, the brain starts a healing process and it can almost go back to normal. It's the same with smoking in your lungs, all kinds of things like that. Yeah, question, go ahead. Is it a time duration or amount of use? What is the time duration? It depends on how often you use it, how long it's been used for. Uh, uh, is that what you're asking? Is there a time duration to get to heat the brain recovering? Yeah, it just depends on if you're a habitual and you've been using, let's say, crack cocaine for a long time, uh, it, it's gonna it's gonna be hard. I've got a very very close uh, relative who has now been uh, struggling with uh, crack cocaine, and uh, uh, he, when when he, this person gets cleaned up, um, you can see the brain starts to heal a little bit, and there's some some. It, but but as soon as he falls again, it's like it gets back into this process. It this may be, he's been using probably 15, 18 years now. It's gonna be a long time before that brain's healed up again. Why do people what? Like, if people can, like, the brain can heal itself from it, then why Well, because ultimately, the, 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 sometimes the damage isn't, is still there, and so, in other words, you, 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 you try and get off of it for a while, and the brain starts the healing process, but it's not fully healed. <laughs> or there's other emotional things going on, right? Uh, we, we, there's associations, we'll talk about learned associations, and people go, the only thing I like that is this drug, and, so there's just a, 
it's a process and not all drugs work alike and not all people's brains work alike, but they go back to it probably because they like the pleasure. And then the brain gets impacted again. I don't know if that answers your question, but by the way, ecstasy, uh, I'll put this up and so you can write it down as we answer a couple more questions, but serotonin is involved in what's called methylene dioxy methamphetamine. So it's a methamph ecstasy is a methamphetamine that's manufactured and they call it methylene, methylene, di, di, methylene dioxy methamphetamines, MDMA, that's even easier. Okay, question, yeah. No, okay. This, by the way, releases serotonin, flooding the brain um, with this, what we call mood regulator, and that's why people who take uh, ecstasy kind of go, oh, this feels so great. Well, yeah, because all that serotonin that you have here in these vesicles, they just open up, push, pour out all the serotonin, and people are like, oh, I feel great. And they feel great for a long time, hours. And uh, there's other problems, though, that come in when serotonin floods the system. So how do like, drugs kill you then? At the end of the day, what's gonna probably end up killing most people who use drugs, it's not going to be that the drug is, uh, kills you from the, the toxicity of the drug. The reason someone's going to die, let's say, from crack cocaine is because they're going to use it in such a way it begins to shut down other body sy uh, systems and they become increasingly desperate for its use. And that leads them to do riskier behavior. So they start to steal, lie, cheat, go out, get involved in things that will, that will kill people. <laughs> and so at the end of the day, it's usually their need to get more and more and more causes them to do things and they need more and more money to fund this habit. So they're gonna do things that cause them more riskier behavior. That's usually what kills them. Now, th th a lot of, some people die from overdoses and things like that, but, well, uh, and again, this is just a real simplified form, but norepinephrine uh, for bipolar disorder, that, that, if you can't read it because it's in red, it says bipolar manic depressive, which we're gonna talk about uh, under psychological uh, disorders. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about bipolar today, but I just wanted to point out that norepinephrine is the neurotransmitter that's uh, frequently associated with this, and so the treatment for um, some of this is, it's a pretty straightforward uh, drug called lithium that we use to help treat manic depressives, but we'll talk more about that when it comes to disorders. Uh, I just wanted to put it up there for you. One more, GABA is a tranquilizer, and what that means is a tranquilizer. <laughs> you guys know who that was, right? Most everybody's seen good old David. But a tranquil, a GABA is this, it's gamma amino butyric acid. Just write down GABA. GABA, ready, Here, here's this nerve cell. This one neurotransmitter, it, it, it wants to send a message to the next neurotransmitter and we call that excitatory. So your brain has these excitatory message and so, can I borrow your key or something? Or do you, oh, it's around your neck, is that okay anyway? Yeah. Huh? So here's the key, here's the neurotransmitter and it comes across, this is excitatory because it tells the next nerve cell, it goes like this, attaches here, clicks, the gate opens, the, the, the ions flow through, and that says, that ion comes in here and it goes like this, oh, send the message, that's excitatory. Send the message, that's a stimulant for example. Send the message, send the message, send the message. So many of our neurotransmitters are what we call excitatory. GABA is an inhibitory. GABA is a neurotransmitter that goes like this, and it could come in and it said, it would open up and the message that would come through th would say, don't fire, don't fire, don't fire. Because if your brain only had excitatories, it would go wild, fire, 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 fire. GABA comes in as the brakes. GABA is the brakes on the system that say, don't fire, don't fire, don't fire, slow down. We call those tranquilizers. So it stops, for example, things like your thought. People take anti-anxiety medication when they're overly anxious, because watch this. Here's a person who's uh, overly anxious. Their thoughts, just they'll, they'll say something like this. My thoughts, I can't turn them off. I just, they just keep going and going and going. So we give them something like GABA, which is used for anti-anxiety, and the thoughts go like this. And all of a sudden, GABA comes in. Don't fire, don't fire. And they say, gosh, finally, my thoughts feel like I can control them. They're not just running wild. Does that make sense? So it slows down the system. At high levels, it's like a tranquilizer. And that's, what this, that's why this is such a cute little video. If you've ever seen a kid on a tranquilizer. Yeah, I know. How did it go? 
He just got back from the dentist. Yeah. Kind of felt good, didn't it? Is this real life? Yeah, this is real life. Okay, now. Oh, now I have two fingers. Good. Four fingers. Four fingers. No, uh, uh, uh. don't put that in. Don't put it in your mouth. Okay. You feel good? I can't see anything. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I can't see. That's the effect of a tranquilizer. Uh, on this kid and that gab, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what he, what, what he had, so there, I could be wrong with this one, but my guess is there was some sort of inhibitory going on there that blocks the pain and slows down everything, and he's like, is this real life? So. Remember, there's a difference between inhibitories and excitatories, and uh, they have different actions on that receiving nerve cell. An agonist and an antagonist is another thing just to keep in mind as we move forward between these. A agonists mimic or fool, antagonists block the receptors, and so remember we talked about all addictive drugs either mimic or fool the receptors or block the receptors um, or or even broader than that, they do more than just receptors, but agonists and antagonists. And uh, so if, something's your, if somebody's your antagonist, you can think of it that way. If they're, in, uh, if they're an antagonist to you, they what? They work against you, right? They're your enemy. They're my antagonist, they block. All right? There's a, a, a drug called Karari, it's a poison. You take uh, in South American jungles, in fact I had a student in here who lived not far from tribes that would do this and they would take the tip of an arrow and they'd dip it in this, this um, what literally was karari, it was a poison, and they would shoot, let's say, an animal like a monkey and this arrow would hit the monkey and it would in, put in this, this karari and what it would do is it would block acetylcholine. So how do you think this monkey ended up, how do they catch that monkey? If you, get, if you shoot a monkey with an arrow and it doesn't kill them, but it puts karari into them that blocks acetylcholine, what will that monkey, what will the first symptoms be if acetylcholine isn't working? They, they'll be walking around and all, they're moving in the tree, let's say for example, and all of a sudden they'll just start to slow down and fall out of the tree. And their breathing will become very labored because they don't have acetylcholine and they'll just sit there like that. It was still alive, most, if they, unless you hit them with too much. Uh, but that's an antagonist. Tobacco is an agonist. It fools it. So it, it, it makes acetylcholine work better. So if you gave this monkey shot with Karari a hit cigarette, it would probably get better. All right? So neurotransmitters, just real quickly, in disease, like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, schizophrenia, depression, we talked about many of those um, uh, addictions, heroin, cocaine, alcohol, tobacco, and then withdrawals. So if you have any questions, now's the time. Why do um, people, some people say that marijuana is not addictive? Uh, marijuana is addictive. It has, a, it, it has a less of a physical addictive capacity than some other drugs. Fewer people get physically addictive to marijuana than almost th than, uh, the other addicted drugs. But there's a, a greater psychological dependency on marijuana. So psycho psychologically, there's this learned behavior, calming effect, whatever it is that people um, who use marijuana to high degrees um, start to report, and, and that can be as strong as some of the physical dependencies. But that's why they're saying, ah, it's not as addictive, or, or it, but it is addictive. It's just not as addictive as a lot of the other drugs out there. But the psychological side to it is, and its influence on memory systems is now, uh, after watching uh, th 30, 40 years of people who have used it for that long, they're starting to find uh, uh, brain changes in their capacity to remember things. And that's just taken a long time to show. Yeah. Yeah, their brains, the, the reason uh, on some of these documentaries that show differences of what marijuana does in the brain, 
what happens is it doesn't seem to come out much. People behaviorally don't show too many things, except for after a number of years, it starts to show up differently. And then that's why I'm talking about these whole memory systems that get impacted. So her comment was it seemed, they're showing how marijuana has a greater effect on some of the brain chemistry than even cocaine does. And um, that, that's, what's, that's what's kind of scary that's coming out. They're, they're, they're not showing as many physical addictions, but people are psychologically coming, becoming addicted and the brain is still impacted regardless whenever we put these in. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, amphetamines have uh, medicinal uses, though, don't they? What does? Amphetamines? Oh, yeah. Amphetamines, there's almost all of these drugs have at some point and can be used in a way that's pretty helpful in the right dose at the right time and the right, you know, with the right person. And so, yeah, something like amphetamines has all kinds of help or benefits for somebody who's struggling, let's say, with a form of maybe like a depression or other kinds of disorders in which some sort of bringing in that stimulant can help. But it's usually done at a, at a, at a, you know, under a doctor's supervision, for example, so that some of the consequences or negative effects don't occur. But yeah, there are some. These aren't, it's only when these get abused and used outside, of, let's say, of a kind of a controlled setting is when the danger can occur. Go ahead. Yeah, people talk about all kinds of drugs. Well, by, by the way, drugs that are addicted and, and, uh, and that have this addictive capacity to them are always something that make people feel pleasure. And oftentimes it makes them feel other things like hallucinogenics, like an LSD. So you remember, you know the difference in some drug capacities, some that are depressants, like alcohol. If you take alcohol, it's a depressant. Ready? It increases your brain's likelihood of slowing down. So a better way of saying it, your brain just simply slows down. It's a depressant. Amphetamines are stimulants, for example. Cocaine is, actually, cocaine's probably more of an interesting one, but marijuana has some, some, some similarities to something like a hallucinogenic, like an LSD, and that's, people kind of have strange, weird thoughts. They go, oh, I think better or clearer or more interesting things, when um, that's probably up for, up for debate if they do, but that's what they feel. It's just, a, it's just an interpretation of that state and what they will report is that. Doesn't mean it to be true. By the way, just list four, uh, five different ways that neurotransmitters are influenced by things like cocaine. Uh, by things, so cocaine would block reuptake mechanisms. Um, uh, seron gas would inactivate a chemical that alters or takes away acetylcholine. It would take that away, so your body's flooded with acetylcholine, so seron gas would be work on the process number four. The binding site, so something like the Karari poison we talked about, would go in and block this little, right here, it would block this site, binding site, like a piece of gum right inside of a, a lock, so that the key will come across and it'll just be blocked. Or the release site. Um, releasing all of the chemicals, like for example, MDMA, ecstasy, is like just simply, that's how M e ecstasy works at the release site. And then the synthesis site, some drugs go in and tell your brain, make more, make more, make more. Okay. Um, any last questions on neurotransmitters or on the nerve self firing and, and functioning? I think you guys have got it. Yes. Uh, so with that like, um, like poison arrow thing with the monkey, does it like, that's a good question. The, the poison she asked, does it, where does it take place? Kind of in the peripheral and the muscles and the brain. Usually what happens is Karari gets into the blood system, goes and starts to impact, impact the motor cortex of the brain, which then has an impact, impact on the peripheral. Oh. That's how it works. Well, okay. Uh, oh, sex on the brain. Um, you don't have to write this down. Uh, in fact, I'll just skip through it real quick, but uh, people have asked this, do men and women brains, are they different? And the answer is, on average, the brains of men and women are neither better nor worse, but they, there are differences. Anybody want, what, what are some differences that you heard? Men's brains are? This isn't the beginning of a joke, by the way. <laughs> nor is it blank. They're typically bigger, but not necessarily smarter. 
They're just bigger. They're also, they have, we have more gray matter, which is the act, what we call that part of active neurons. You don't have to write this down. If you want to, you could. I'm not gonna hold you to it on a test. It's just information. Women's brains are probably faster and more efficient. <laughs> which just simply means that there's, when we measure speed and we look at efficiency, there's some different processing. It doesn't make you smarter. Smart, but, but it could be because these neurons seem to be packed more closely together. Again, in general, on average, the brains of men and women are neither better nor worse, but there's some differences that people are finding interesting. Women's brains, while men might have more gray matter, women seem to have more white matter, which is kind of responsible for a lot of communication between different areas of the brain. And then they seem to be more complexly corrugated, corrugated, which means they're more folded in and, and uh, kind of wrinkled-like. It feels like there's a joke here somewhere, doesn't it? <laughs> Y'all just waiting for it, huh? Well, you're gonna have to wait a little longer. Uh, men and women appear to use different parts of the brain to encode memories, sense emotions, recognize faces, and solve certain problems and make decisions. But that's just in general, people have always asked that, Do men, are men's brains different than women's brains? And, the answer is we're pretty close, in, 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 but there are some subtle differences. And whether or not these translate into major behavioral differences um, is really open for debate. But um, just since we're studying the brain, I thought I'd put this up there and let you see it. Questions on it? It's just more FYI for fun. I got to come up with a joke somewhere. It's a de dangerous area to tread into. Organization of the brain, ready? That's a brain. The part in yellow would be the brain stem. Any of your, what we call survival functions that are automatic, your breathing, your heartbeat, all of those automatic functions are really controlled in this area called the brain stem. And so one of the ways that we think about the brain are in these three systems, this automatic survival functions. If you, if you do something to your brain stem, you're probably, if it's damaged enough, you're not going to survive that. Because your heart, your breathing, all kinds of things that we just simply do on an automatic basis are gonna, it's gonna be wiped out. The limbic system, for example, your amygdala or thalamus or hypothalamus, whatever, the, where your emotional states are, so when I told you about the guys, the person, patient X, who couldn't see visually, things uh, but could f it have what's called affective blind sight. It's because the limbic system or this, this emotional state could pick out the emotional context still from things that were going through his eyes down this other pathway. Uh, and he, that he was utilizing the limbic system to have affective blind sight. He felt what looked like what was an emotion. That was a limbic system, all right? Damage here. It's, it's gonna mess up emotion. So there was a guy that climbed a tower at the University of Texas, golly, 45 years ago now. Climbed a tower at the University of Texas, took a gun and started shooting people. And um, at the end of the day, I think there were, I, I, it was somewhere in the 20s or 30s, a number of people that were dead. Uh, a good friend of mine, her dad was at the University of Texas that day, on this day of the shooting, walked out, heard the popping, uh, they told him, get back in, so they all, everybody stepped back in. Uh, he was a, but anyway, this guy named Charles Whitman, and, and uh, he, he's the one that was doing the shooting. A, a, a police officer finally got up onto this tower where he was shooting the, and, and killed him. And, uh, and when they did the autopsy, he had a huge uh, growth in his limbic system. And for weeks before that, he kept talking about his emotions, he said, he, he kept talking about, he just couldn't control them and he'd fly into rage and he kept talking about this inability to, to, to for the first time he's feel, feeling all these horrible rotten emotions and he couldn't stop them and turn them off. And so, so there's damage being done there um, in a weird way. So that's the limbic area. The part about that distinguishes us, uh, if you want, from lower organisms and it's because it's the, the cerebral cortex in humans is so, uh, uh, large and complex, if you want, in its functioning, but it's where we process our information a lot. 
And it's this kind of the part you see when you, when you see pictures of the brain and what people usually are looking at as the cerebral cortex, not only receiving and processing information, but it directs actions, uh, makes decisions, uh, and that's what's going on at the cerebral cortex level. So in general, you could organize the brain into systems like that, the brainstem and the limbic system and the cerebral, the cerebral system. Um, so, all right, now we're going to step back from neurotransmitters and then from even the brain. Now we're gonna look at all this, this whole functioning. But before I do that, let me give you one more way that you can organize the brain, and that is by um, geographical divisions. And give me some geographical divisions of the brain that you know of. What does that mean when I say geographical divisions, what do you think of? Hemisphere. Think of like lobes or hemispheres. Some of you think about countries. <laughs> so this would be an American right there. You see the brain right there? <laughs> it's an American brain. This would be a brain in love. You see the heart right there? That's, I know, that's in love. So you can do an MRI and see. No, I'm talking about the frontal lobes, the parietal lobes. That was a joke for a lot of people. You didn't get it very well. And I, I, but it was mostly this division geographically is in the frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal lobes. So when I talked about uh, patient X, there was a stroke that occurred between his eye and his occipital lobe, and the occipital lobe is where vision takes place, and so the stroke occurred somewhere on this pathway up here, uh, on this what called this high road, and so this is where we process, for example, vision in the occipital lobe. Now, so, so oh, by the way, let me just give you for this class, uh, for the exam, ready? You do not need to memorize the anatomy of the brain. The details of the brain, where it's, other than what I put up here, if I put it up here on the screen and we talked about that, you should know all of that. But other than that, there's a lot on the brain and I, here's what, I'm not going to make you memorize it all. It's just, it, one day for another class you may need to, for this class, intro to psychology, you don't need to. Does that sound good? You do not need to memorize the full anatomy of the brain. Just what I've given you up here. Now questions? Okay. For seizures, what's happening, so many, since many of you are familiar with seizures, what's going on in the brain during a seizure? There's a small or large part of a, somebody's brain that's got a, dis, a dysfunction to it. This, this dysfunctioning part of the brain is sending out and causing high levels of electricity. And these high levels of electricity, they're going like this. What happens is that you have a, a part of the brain that that's, has some sort of, um, it could have been so, a deformity they're born with or some, some sort of trauma. But it's, it's, what it does is it sends out a message electrically and for some reason it hits the center part of the brain and gets amplified through this thing called the corpus callosum, which connects the two hemispheres. And so a seizure happens when this dysfunctioning part of the brain sends off a lot of electricity and the corpus callosum, which shares information between the two hemispheres, amplifies it. And they go into electrical seizure. It's a seizure with too much electricity. How many know the person that deals with epilepsy? How many, medic how many know they're taking drugs or medication that seems to help them? How many know somebody who has had it even worse where medication doesn't help or they have had other things go on? All right. People are, a lot of people are familiar with some of these things. I'm going to show you extreme cases. Remember, it goes like this. Most epilepsy is controlled, petite mal and grand mal types of seizures with medication. You would imagine what, which of the drugs that I talked about, the neural uh, neurochemicals, a neurotransmitters, which one would you give somebody if, if you had to decide which neurotransmitter that all the ones I talked about would you give them? There's too much activity. There's electric. Which neurotransmitter? You'd give them GABA because it's a what? It's an inhibitory. It slows down. It calms it down. It's a tranquilizer, and that's kind of what they'll take or a variation of that. 
In severe cases, when the neurotransmitters uh, and or the drugs that they're given aren't impacted or affected and they don't stop the seizures, they can do some other things like, ready? They go in, what, what, they, what can they do in severe cases? What have they done before? It, remember this electricity that's starting, it hits the, the corpus callosum and it's like a, it just amplifies it. So they go in and they separate your brain, your left brain from your right brain and they cut the corpus callosum and that electricity goes and stops right there. And this half of the brain isn't affected and the seizures oftentimes stop. Severing this causes a left brain and a right brain not to communicate. So if you went to somebody who had this surgery to stop them, you could actually, if you can get something into like this ear, information that comes into this ear, my right ear goes into which hemisphere? Yeah, it goes into my left hemisphere. So if you whispered into this ear, it would have to be, it would have to be a special thing, but I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute. In a simplified version, this left ear information, or my, sorry, my right ear information would go into my left hemisphere, and if I had this severed, it wouldn't share it, so this half of the brain wouldn't even know what this half knows. Does that make sense? So, in situations where this has occurred, here, here's, a, here's a person who had split brain surgery, and you'll see what happened. Normally, both sides of the brain work in concert. A massive system of fibers, called the corpus callosum, carries impulses to and from each side. Have a silver clip ready, please. In the early 1960s, surgeons revived an old technique of cutting the corpus callosum to control massive seizures in some epileptics. The operation works. It also provides an opportunity to study the different properties of the two hemispheres. It's important to remember that all of these patients suffered from poorly controlled epilepsy. Therefore, some of the findings may reflect changes in brain organization secondary to the epilepsy. Vicky is a split brain patient. Because of her epilepsy, surgeons severed her corpus callosum. Now, her right hemisphere can no longer communicate directly with her left. I knew what I wanted to wear. And I would open up my closet, get ready to take it out. My other hand would, like, just take control. It would reach in and get something that I wouldn't want at all. You know, and then I get, I don't know, frustrated, and I throw the one on the bed that I don't want. Instead, so a lot of times I can't even hang them back up. This antagonistic behavior between hands occurs only right after split brain surgery. Vicky actually does very well in her daily activities, even though her left hemisphere is disconnected from her right. It takes special testing to reveal the different processing styles of the two hemispheres. Vicky is frequently tested at Cornell Medical Center by Dr. Michael Gazaniga. Okay. The tests are designed to send different kinds of information to each hemisphere. I simply want you to describe them to me. Just name the picture you see. Okay. Okay? Right. So get ready and look right at the dot. Fixate the dot. Look right at the dot. explain in just a minute but the football showed up in her right visual field which went to her left brain which is where language is football she said shoe then he put something over here in her left eyes left the left part of her visual field which went to the right brain which doesn't have language Does that make sense so now the part of the brain that doesn't have language uh, is, uh, has seen, let's say, a woman on the phone, but it doesn't have a lot of verbal capacity. It can't say woman on the phone. Does that make sense? So she's struggling and she's going, woman. Okay? And then they ask her, keep going. What, is it, what, is she, what does she see? Um, um, 
Okay, I tell you what, open your eyes. He's asking, what does she do? What, what's that yeah. woman doing on the phone? Or what's that woman doing right. in the picture? What she was doing. Close your eyes and just let your left hand go. It went in from her left visual field to her right brain, which doesn't have language. But her right brain controls what side of her body? Her right brain controls what side of her body? Her left. Does her left hand know what she saw? So he now says, okay, you can't say what it was. Write with your left hand what the woman was doing. What was the woman doing? She was talking on the telephone. But she can't say it because this hemisphere, the right hemisphere doesn't have the language, but the right hemisphere controls the left hand. So what is she going to write with her left hand? Or she can't say what the woman's doing. Vicky's right hemisphere doesn't have the language to describe the whole picture, but it can express itself through her left hand. Good. What did you write? Skipping yes, what, rope. what did you huh? write? Mm -hmm. Skipping rope? Skipping rope? Uh, let, me show you what, let me show you what you wrote there. She wrote telephone with her left hand, but when you asked her what was the lady doing, she goes skipping rope. <laughs> because it doesn't know what she was doing <laughs> verbally, so she made it up. That's crazy. We've had people who have had, by the way, the making it up thing is also one little curious aside for the human brain. We've had uh, individuals to control ep epileptic seizures have had their brain mapped out and they put in little electrodes that stimulate a part of their brain and one person, they, they know a part of the motor cortex that if they stimulated it, and this person didn't know this that had this done, but they found out that every time they pushed one of these little clicker buttons over here on this person who had this electrode in their brain that to control these seizures, there would happen to be one of the buttons that when they pushed it, the person would go like this. As soon as they pushed it, the person would go like that. <laughs> that's what they would do. They didn't know that's why they were doing it because some guy over here was pushing button B, <laughs> but the guy would push button B and unbeknownst to them, push button B and the person would go like that. So what do you think happened when we asked the person after their, we'd say, what are you doing? What do you think they said? Oh, I don't know, somebody's pushing the letter B, I guess. <laughs> Is that what they said? No. What they said was what? They go, oh, I just thought I saw somebody. <laughs> oh, so there was something, something over there, something flashed, and I thought there was somebody that I knew over there. That's weird, isn't it? Okay, do you get what she just did? It's just that, that was an aside, by the way. Telephone. Yeah, what was she doing? She wrote down telephone, she's reading it now. Talking on the so here's a quick explanation. Yeah. Good. Perfect. Vicky saw the picture in her left visual field. The image was projected to the right side of both eyes. The visual information then traveled to her right hemisphere. It understood the picture, but could only say woman. Then she was instructed to write using her left hand. Her right hemisphere directed her hand to spell out the other feature of the picture. Dr. Gazaniga asked what she had written. The left hemisphere tried to guess. It had not seen telephone, but it had heard the right hemisphere say woman. The left hemisphere then searched for a word that might be associated with the question of what the woman was doing, and she said skipping rope. When both hemispheres later saw the written word, the left, which had heard the right say woman, could now give a complete description, woman on the phone. How about another one here? This one they're going to try and fool her. They're going to put clap and laugh at the same time. Both hemispheres respond to the words. The left triggers her smile, the right makes her clap. So the left saw the word laugh, and she's going, laugh. <laughs> laugh. Laugh. See, that's how you have fun with psychology, man. Because it could get picking boring all day long, doing things like that. No, not really. That's not fun. It's just to show you the difference.
That's kind of weird. By the way, you take a person like this and they can take, if it goes into the right hemisphere where there's not a lot of language and they go like this, you give them something uh, in their left hand that they would know easily if you put it in their right hand. Because So like, uh, like a toothbrush, if you put it in her tooth uh, like this, she, she, she would go like this. And she couldn't see it, she'd touch it, she'd go, well, it's elongated plastic stick thing. <laughs> and then she went like this, by the way, she went with the bristles. And when the bristles went through and the bristles, she went like this, the bristle sound went into both ears and she goes like this, she goes, oh, that's a toothbrush. Because it went into the right, the other hemisphere which had language. So. That's just kind of an example of the corpus callosum. Any, are there any questions? Does that make sense? The right and left hemisphere have different, different capacities. Uh, so if you have damage here, probably your speech, speech is going to be impacted on your left hemisphere. Simple comprehension on your right. All right, any questions on that? Yes. Ooh, let me show you if she had a different kind. I'll show you in just a minute. Are you sure it was a split brain? Uh, yeah, I remember she had brain surgery. Brain surgery. I think I'll tell you what she probably had. How old was she, by the way? It, now that you knew, do you know how old she was when she had the surgery? Maybe like five-ish. Yeah, if she's five, I'll show you I, what she might have. I'll show you next, the next video. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yes. And I'm gonna show you something else here in just a second that while this is a pretty, as we become adults, these become a little bit more uh, set in stone, for example, but as children and as we're learning, there's a lot of plasticity to this. That means changes. So changes, and you can do some radical things and it's not yet kind of set, and so one half, if it's messed up, can take over for the other half. And that's an example at severe cases when you have a hemispherectomy to cut the brain in half and then take out half the brain for, for major seizures is a common treatment for very severe cases in which a brain entire half is damaged and kids are showing epileptic are showing seizures regularly every few minutes sometimes and a whole half of their body is not functioning well because of this brain not having appropriate work so they can if the child is under the age of 7 or 8 the younger the child the better so let me just show you an example of someone who had Rasmussen syndrome, which is, you'll see in just a minute, what it causes, a lot of seizures. And um, it, this happened for this little girl, at, I think right after the age of three. Um, and here is her after this, they've taken out half her brain. We are beginning to harness the brain's incredible ability to invent itself, then reinvent itself throughout life. This girl is a testament to the amazing resilience of the human brain. Young Jody Miller leads an idyllic life as a nine-year-old girl. You would never guess that she has undergone some of the most drastic surgery imaginable. Jody's first three years were textbook normal. Then, about six weeks after her third birthday, a storm of epileptic seizures took control of her brain. She couldn't use her left arm hardly at all. Uh, she could barely use the left leg, seizing a good, good deal of the time, multiple types of seizures. Ordinary life became impossible. Medicines did nothing and the seizures threatened to turn fatal. Desperate, Jody's parents brought her to pediatric neurologist Eileen Vining. We found her seizures were all, all coming from her right hemisphere. 
And we knew that there is virtually nothing else, nothing but Rasmussen syndrome that can produce that picture uh, in a young child. Rasmussen syndrome is a degenerative brain disorder that disrupts the electrical activity that makes our brains work. Tiny electrical explosions were flaring up in Jody's right hemisphere. As seizures became almost constant, she lost control of her left side. Only one radical treatment option remained. We knew that she was never going to have her seizures controlled with medicine, and we knew that she and her family faced taking out that half of the brain. Okay. Dr. Vining recommended a daring surgery called a hemispherectomy. It would be performed by pediatric neurosurgeon Ben Carson. The whole concept of taking out half of a person's brain uh, would seem to, to most people impossible. Human beings are incredible creatures with a brain that is beyond belief in terms of its capabilities. To the point where we can take half of it out and still function in a normal way. 85% of our brain consists of the cerebral cortex, which is divided into two hemispheres, each with four main lobes. The cortex handles many of our higher functions. Areas on both sides control thinking, movement, and sensation. But the right side controls our left side, and vice versa. Jody would lose almost all of her right hemisphere, and the cavity would fill with cerebrospinal fluid. The operation has to be performed with great precision to avoid damaging the parts of the brain that control Jody's life functions, like heartbeat and breathing. The surgery went flawlessly. What we're looking at here is an image, an MRI, that was done on Jody after her surgery. And what it shows us is the fact that we in removed her entire right hemisphere. And what we're able to see here is indeed her very normal left hemisphere and all the beautiful gyri of her cortex. And we can see right down the middle, the right hemisphere that was there is now replaced by fluid. But how could Jody function normally with only one hemisphere? It's because of a miraculous ability of the brain called plasticity our brains can actually change shape, creating new connections between neurons or brain cells to replace lost or damaged ones. Jody's left brain started reconnecting almost immediately. At least as good as this. And if I remember, he wore pink, just like you. This young lady had half her brain removed, went home, I guess maybe 10 days later, and was already walking. She was ambulating. She was able to walk out of the hospital. And that's because her left hemisphere had such resilience, such plasticity. It was able to say, okay, something needs to move her left leg. Whoa. You gonna open it? It's pretty cool. Uh, what ends up happening, by the way, she's now like 20 some and lost to her making straight A's and um, doing well. I don't know if that's what she had or not, your friend, similar to that. All right, hey, that's it for the brain. Uh, next time we'll start talking at Child Development, unless you have questions on this. Uh, we'll go starting a new chapter on Mon uh, Wednesday. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.